Well, yesterday, <laughs> just during an amazing lunch with the uh, old panelists and the uh, Nonic team, we start talking about how hard is and time consuming uh, writing on touch screen keyboards, even for a simple tweet. Well, someone is trying to make our life better, thanks to Ben Madlock. Where is Ben? <clears throat> testing, testing. One, two, one, two. Great. Um, so first of all, I must apologize. You're going to be getting very tired of English accents. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to understand me and I can be as clear as Alex was. Great. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the company that I co-founded, TouchType. And I'm going to talk a little bit in general about computing and how we, how we can apply new techniques to solve difficult problems. So typing on smartphones is difficult, um, particularly touchscreen phones. Um, and this has is, this is actually spawned a, a whole craze for things that have gone badly wrong when you're trying to type. So I just wanted to, to raise a few of these. Uh, so this, uh, this chap here, he was asked how his day was going. And uh, he, he sent this message, oh, awful. I have a bad case of the man boobs. Now, what he actually meant to say was Mondays. And uh, this kind of mistake actually happens quite a lot. I mean, th th this site is primarily in English, but I'm sure there's uh, examples in other languages. So on this side, this, this person um, tried to say that, that he can't come over tonight because he's, he's feeding his grandparents. And accidentally, he said hostages instead of grandparents. Um, and finally, on this side, Michel says, uh, I, Oh, babe, I love you too so much. If I could, I'd buy you a casket. So in, uh, in English, a casket is something that you put people in when they're dead. Um, so he actually meant to say castle. So these are, these are examples of some of the, the frustrations of typing on a touchscreen, but there's plenty of different frustrations. Um, so, a general point, I, I guess we all know this, but smartphones have really changed everything in terms of the way that we interact with technology. Um, and and they're, they're now such a part of our day-to-day -day lives. But what we've discovered was that a good typing experience is essential. And actually, it's one of the things that you don't really think about necessarily when, you, when you're buying a, a smartphone. But we did a survey of about 30,000 smartphone users. And actually, 60% of them said that the ability to type easily was essential. Whereas actually, only around 30% said that the appearance of the handset was a, a major consideration. And, and while people really love smartphones, I mean, I'd be interested, actually, how many of you would say that you really enjoy using your smartphone, that you have a positive experience? Wow. Not that many. Okay, well, in our survey, we found that, that uh, people ranked the general use of their smartphone at around 8 out of 10, which is actually pretty high. But they ranked... Oh, hang on. Ah, it's better. But they ranked how they feel about typing on the smartphone as around 6 out of 10. So this, this seems to be lagging behind. So quickly about, about TouchType, the company that, that I'm here to represent. Um, we founded about three years ago. Uh, myself here on the right and my better looking co-founder. Um, we met at Cambridge University and we identified that, that there was this problem and we wanted to see what we could do to solve it, but to solve it in a, in a particularly interesting way. Um, so we, we currently have about 25 employees, and we're looking to grow to around 40 by the end of the year. 
So if anyone here is interested in working for a really exciting company based in London, come and uh, see me afterwards. So a brief overview of, of where we've come from. We, we founded in August 2008. We started filing patents for the core technology, which I'll talk about in a bit, pretty much straight away. Uh, we had our first staff member join in January of last year. And uh, since then, we've, we've grown pretty rapidly. We, uh, we had our first uh, licensing deal, which we signed back in April of last year. Um, we took some investment in the summer of last year. Uh, we launched a, an app called SwiftKey on the Android market September, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, we had our first OEM device launch in February this year, which I'll talk about again. We won the uh, best app at the Mobile Primary Awards, which was at the Mobile World Congress in February. And we, uh, we just passed a million downloads a couple of months ago, and I think that's now about 1.5 million. And coming up, oh, I should mention this. We were part of the uh, Google Honeycomb launch of, of the tablet. And the tablet is a, another challenge for typing, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. OK. Um, so I want to step back a little bit from the problem of text entry and talk about the future of technology. Um, I'm going to cover this in a couple of slides. So my argument is that the future is probabilistic. What I mean by that is that software is going to be increasingly about making the kinds of inferences that people make. And actually, this is what's going to make it useful to us. So I want to put up a little bit of simple mathematics. Probability theory is all about making inferences. So this, this very simple equation here is an expression that represents the probability of an outcome given a certain set of conditions. And this is actually a way of writing down the way people think anyway. So I just wanted to write down a couple of things that people actually do all the time, people and machines. And these are inferences. So this here is, is the probability of profit given a set of product features. And that's actually the kind of decisions that a product designer would make. This next one is the probability that a web page is relevant given a search query. And this is also an inference. And actually, this is the inference that Google makes every time you type a search query. And what I want to show here is that we can represent these two things, both the inferences that humans make and the inferences that machines make, using the same language, the language of probability theory. A couple more. The probability of share price given market history. This is an inference that both machines and humans make on a very regular basis. And then this is actually the inference that we were trying to solve when we founded TouchType. And that is the probability of intended input given the user's interaction with their device, both during that session and historically. So going back to the first slide, what's the probability that the person wanted to talk about man boobs rather than Monday. <laughs> Pretty low, you could argue. So the central message here is that an ever-increasing number of these inferences can actually be made by machines. So that's the, that's the broad picture. I now want to focus back on how can we make that inference? How can we infer what people are trying to type based on what we know about them, the way they've interacted with their device. So at the core of everything that we do at TouchType is a language inference engine called Fluency. And what we did was to take ideas from machine learning and natural language processing, take them out of the universities and put them into a, a, a commercially deployable product. And Fluency enables us to do a number of things to help typing. So this could be disambiguating multiple keystrokes in the traditional sense that you'd be familiar with from something like T9. Uh, it could be correcting mistyping. It could be predicting words in advance or sentences in advance. Um, it could be correcting your spelling. So the thing about making inferences 
by machine is that you have to gather data. This is the absolute lifeblood of the revolution in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we knew that if we wanted to be able to accurately infer language across global languages, that we were going to need to gather a lot of data. So what we did was to enter an agreement with uh, Cambridge University to use the European grid. And the reason I've got this slightly odd picture here is that this is the Large Hadron Collider. And the European grid is the, the network of computers that were put together to analyze the LHC data. Now, thankfully for us, the, the LHC kept breaking down. So we, uh, we kept using what, what we could get of the, the grid resources to scrape all of the publicly available text off the internet and pull it into our, our, our language data sets. So currently, we've collected about a trillion words of, of text data. So another really important aspect of what we do is that if, if, if you're going to if you're going to make typing easy for somebody, if you're going to help them to express themselves in the way that they would want to, you need to understand the way that they use language. And we actually have some fantastic resources these days for doing that. So you already have a, probably a number of online profiles that contain your historical text, contain the, the way that you've expressed yourself over the last few months. And we can actually use that data to, to, to encapsulate your style of typing, writing, your style of language. As a, as a test for this idea of personalizing prediction technology to an individual, we gathered all of the song lyrics from Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber. And we wanted to see how well our prediction engine would represent the type of things that these personalities would be likely to say. So we prime the prediction engine with these words, I want to be in your. And then we, see, we, we polled it to see what would come out. And what, what's quite interesting is, if, if you know something about the personalities of these two people, then you see that actually the, the type of language that they use in context is quite representative of their personalities, you might argue. So the, the, the machine learning that we apply to text entry is not just about language. It's also about actually physically the way you, you interact with your device. With, with touch screens, we have a much richer um, source of data for how you actually carry out that interaction. So what we do is, is, is we model the way that you type. And then we use probability theory to help us to estimate the things that you, that you meant to say, and to help us to estimate how accurate you are as a typist. So for instance, this is what the, the, um, a representation of a careful typist would look like. And this is a representation of a more sloppy typist who's just hammering the keys. So one of the things we did was, was quite a lot of experiments on how powerful could we make a prediction engine? You know, if, 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 we, if we knew about you and the way that you typed, how predictable are people, actually? How much in advance can we know broadly what you're going to say if we give you a few options? And what we found is that approximately a third of words can actually be predicted without any character entry if you give the user two or three options. Um, and this is because the way language works is that most of it is quite formulaic. You say a lot of things that you've said before, but with slight nuances. So you might say a sentence, like, looking forward to seeing you at 7 p.m. And actually, a lot of that sentence might be what, just what you would normally say. And then the thing that varies might be the time that you're meeting, or you want to add a little quirk in. Um, we found that actually around 85% of words could be predicted with two or fewer characters. And this is really just an example to say that it's possible to model language using probability theory. So what we did then was to combine these ideas into an application in order for us to be able to demonstrate to people how this might work in practice. 
<clears throat> and I think what's important is actually we're, we're not committed to a particular UI for, for keyboards. We're actually working with quite a lot of manufacturers, OEMs, to, to provide different types of keyboard experiences, but all of them using this underlying technology. So I want to briefly talk about some of the products that we've designed. Um, some of them are publicly available. Some of them are uh, direct through our partners. So the most important thing is, is that our vision, as I was saying, is to take this background technology and use it behind a wide range of different devices, different form factors. Um, and people want variety, and, but the interesting thing is that the, the way people interact, and, and particularly the language that captures the way they express themselves, actually is quite common across different devices. And we want to provide something that gives, gives a consistent typing experience. So last year, we, we released an app called SwiftKey. Um, and it's actually very simple. The idea of SwiftKey is that you have three suggestions just above the keyboard. And we only ever offer three suggestions. And you can, you can type on a, a very standard looking keyboard in order to prompt the prediction engine to, to help it to guess the right word that you're looking for. And actually, um, we've, especially with new generation of SwiftKey, we've, we've been uh, working on helping people who like to type in different styles. So I'd actually be very interested to do a quick poll here. Um, if you're the kind of person who holds your phone in one hand and types with the other hand, either with one thumb or with one finger, can you raise your hand? Okay, cool. And if you're the type of person who holds your phone with two hands and types with two thumbs, can you raise your hand? Okay, so I'm, I'm guessing that that's probably... 70 to 80% two thumb typists and 20 to 30% one finger typists. And all of you who didn't raise your hand, I don't even want to know how you typed. Um, so what, what we're trying to do is, is, is enable a UI that really works for both types of people. So what we find with SwiftKey is a lot of people do actually like to pick words and minimize the number of keystrokes that they have to enter to, to get text into their device. Other people just like to thumb mash and to have the, the software correct them. And actually, we're, we're really working hard to serve both communities because the underlying inference technology is the same. Um, we recently released a, a tablet keyboard beta. And actually, this was the, uh, this was the keyboard that we, we demoed with Google when they launched Honeycomb in February. And then we, we, we saw that Apple introduced a split QWERTY keyboard a, a couple of, well, I guess a couple of weeks ago now. So clearly everybody's thinking along the same lines. But this is very similar technology. It's, it's just thinking a bit about how you can make typing on a tablet productive. Um, our first OEM client is a, a, a British phone manufacturer called INQ, or Inc. Um, and they recently launched a Facebook phone that has our technology embedded. And uh, it's, it's an interesting little device. They have a roadmap for, um, for, for some other, perhaps higher-end devices coming out uh, over the next few years. But what, what was really interesting is that they wanted something that was focused towards the social network generation. And the idea of a personalized typing experience was very important to them, people sending messages um, you know, using Facebook chat, that kind of thing. Um, what I can't talk about at the moment is the, the, the opportunities that we're working on at the moment. So we have a lot of projects that are ongoing for devices that will be coming out over the next few months, and we're really excited about that. So if you watch the tech press, hopefully there'll be some news on that in the next few weeks. So... Looking quickly at the market response to, to our products and technology, um, just looking at SwiftKey, we, uh, we've actually been in the, t in the top 10 paid Android apps for the, the last 10 to 12 months. And 
what, what would be fantastic is if Apple allowed us to replace their default keyboard because being at the top of the Android paid market is fantastic, but you don't make a huge amount of money out of it. And there's, there's a huge difference between Apple and Android in that at the moment. Um, I've already talked a little bit about uh, SwiftKey winning the, the Mobile Premier Awards. We have a, a really great community of what we call VIP users. And actually, this is now just over 25,000. And we give these people access to early versions. Um, and, and we've really worked together with the community to look at the kind of things that are important to people when they're typing on their phones. This is just some, some feedback from users. So I wanted to, to end, really, by looking at uh, some of the user survey data for how people felt about typing on, on phones. As I said, we carried out this um, analysis uh, on, a, on a, around 30,000 uh, smartphone users in collaboration with a, with a tech blog called Smartphone Experts. Um, and we asked people questions about how they felt about different aspects of their typing experience. So the error correction, the word prediction, learning new words, the overall typing experience, and then how this affects the overall phone experience. And what we found was that um, there was a number of trends. I think with, with the fragmentation of Android and with the explosive growth, and in some ways it feels like manufacturers are scrambling to keep up, the, the general phone experience, particularly in terms of typing, was significantly lower than the others. Um, and this enabled us to, to do a, a sort of comparison survey for Android users who had downloaded and used SwiftKey. Um, and what we found was that the, the orange here is uh, SwiftKey users, that across the board, the typing experience was very much more positive. Um, but actually also that once you improve the typing experience, you actually also improve the overall phone experience. And that's, that raises the, uh, the Android um, experience rating up to much closer to the iPhone. Um, so that was really all I wanted to, to talk about today. Um, thank you very much for listening and for putting up with my English accent. Thank you, Ben. Any question for Ben? Meanwhile, I have one for you. I am an iPhone user. Yep. Uh, can I expect a new keyboard from you on the iPhone? So we are actually looking uh, at the possibility of launching an, an iOS app. But it's going to be different because on Android, we can replace the keyboard, which we can't do on iOS. So we have to build a, a sort of standalone messaging style app. But we're looking into that possibility, yeah. Or buy, or Apple should buy you. Or Apple have to buy us, yeah. Or, or should copy you. I, I doubt they'd be able to afford it, though. <laughs> we have one question. So it's, it's definitely a, a, an impressive application of technology uh, and sort of more deep analytics to a very consumer-oriented thing, which, which I think is, is awesome. Looking at the beta where you guys are doing cloud services, the, being somebody who's eager to try it out, definitely the, the, the fact that you guys have access to all keyboard entries, so passwords, credit card fields, things like that, seems like a pretty big stopper. In fact, I can say it just stopped me from installing the beta. So do you guys have plans to deal with, how do, you, how do you get rid of, or deal with people's concerns around privacy if you're echoing everything people type up to the cloud? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think this is actually a quite a difficult area because this is one of the things that's a real barrier to adoption on Android, I think, in particular. So Android flashes up a message when you first install a, an alternative keyboard that says, essentially, this app will steal your credit card information and log all of your passwords. Um, and a lot of people see that and think, wow, this is coming from the app. This is a disaster. Um, and actually, so we, we, don't, we don't mirror any of the stuff you type to, to our servers. Um, and trying to get that message across to people, that's the first key, I think. And, but it is a challenge, because we can't get around 
the fact that Android throws up these warnings. The, the second thing, I think, is that for, for services that do access you know, message data, that kind of thing, in order to build um, background models and, and to understand you better, and I think that would, you know, that goes for a lot of companies, an ever-increasing amount of companies who access you know, things like social network APIs. I think this is a really big area, and we, we've tried to put together a very clear privacy policy that outlines exactly what we do when you give us your credentials to learn from your historical text. Um, but I think it's something that people will probably talk more and more about as more and more social network um, aware applications are, are, are built. It's a good question. But that's Android, not us. Other questions? Nothing more. Um, what about uh, voice recognition? Um, can we avoid this problem of typing, or are we still far away mm. from, from this way? Mm. OK. Um, so perhaps another, another show of hands. How many people regularly use voice recognition for text entry? Not many. Um, so I, I think voice recognition is, is getting better all the time. And um, I think there are a number of, of companies providing pretty impressive voice recognition solutions. Um, however, for a number of reasons, I think it's very unlikely that this will become the dominant way that people enter text in all circumstances. So when you're out in public and you're on the train or you're in your office, we're very, we're very hardwired to have a way of expressing what we're thinking, what we want to write, without verbalizing it. You know, if, if, you're, if you're sitting next to someone on the bus, you don't want them hearing your, your intimate messages to your partner. Um, so I think even if voice recognition gets to the point where it's perfect, there will still be a very strong argument for a multimodal style of text entry. Um, and I think... The only other thing to add to that is that the kind of inference technology that we're talking about is very much the kind of technology that you would use for both voice recognition and text entry. It's, it's, a, much, it's a model that's much more similar to traditional voice recognition than to traditional keyboard technology. Hi. Um, do you differentiate between the, the behavior between apps? Because the way I write emails and SMS, it's different. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so this is something that we, we've built into the engine. Um, so that the, the, the way we capture languages and what we call language models, and different language models represent different styles of, of typing. So. The, the engine has the ability to dif differentiate between different applications. Now, in SwiftKey at the moment, we don't do it, um, but it's, it's a feature that we are looking to introduce at some point over the next few months. Uh, what about uh, competitors? There are some similar technologies on the market. Do you have some information about uh, comparison uh, yeah. to them? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so w when, we're, when we're pitching to, um, to OEMs and, and other mobile providers, we spend a lot of time comparing what we do to what competitors do. Um, and I think the first thing to say that companies who are focused on the, the back-end language inference side of this, there are very few. Um, there are plenty of companies who are focused on different keyboard UIs. So... I think uh, um, perhaps our, perceptually our major competitor at the moment would be Swipe, which is the, that style of text entry. Um, and uh, they have some great technology, but they're really focused on the, the UI. So our engine would support that kind of trace style UI as well as a more traditional um, tap tapping style. I guess the, the, the major player in this market would be a company called Nuance, who, who provide voice recognition technology as well as uh, keyboard technology. So they own the, the traditional T9 patents. Um, so they're a, a very strong contender in this field. And then there are a whole host of 
smaller providers, mostly focused around building different styles of keyboards. So I write a lot in Basque, and it's a torture. Mm -hmm. I must say, because all the correctors and that. Uh, what can we? Uh, what can we do mm. to help develop something uh, a corrector or something for Basque language? So we we um, we currently support, I think, around 25 languages, and Basque is actually one of the languages that we would like to roll out over the next few months. And the the challenge for us is that there's there's less Basque data on the internet that we can just scrape off. So actually, we're really interested in working with people who um, know where we can get access to data in, the, say, the Basque language, and Galician as well. Um, so we, we would really like to roll something out shortly. And uh, if you have any, any pointers for how we can find data, I'd be really interested to talk to you. Great, thank you. Another question. Come in. Thank you. I want to ask you uh, um, for if you think that uh, tapping keywords were going to replace the like um, typical keyboard. If their quality is going to be good enough to replace them, I mean, mm. at least when we're using not laptop or portable devices, but when we're using uh, like desktop PC or because uh, from day to day is becoming more popular, like uh, uh, iPad and that that kind of devices, and so maybe if it's going to reach the quality of the uh, that kind of the, um, keyword, like the regular yeah. keyword. I think that I, so, so if I understand the question correctly, it's um, do I think that selecting words is likely to replace more standard styles of typing? But also, that would be one part, but also uh, it's not the same, the... the feeling when you're using a tapping keyword or when you're using um, with the one with buttons. Okay, so, so you're also asking whether touchscreen style keyboards will ever replace buttons. Yeah? Okay, well, um, I think that the first one of those questions, it, my answer to that would be that a bit like I said earlier on, there are different People have different styles of, of text entry, particularly on mobiles, which are highly constrained devices in terms of space. And I think some people um, are moved towards a, a less intensive, more intelligent word selection style of text entry. Actually suits them quite well. Um, whereas I think for some people, that's probably never going to suit them very well, and, and they will always be two thumb or multiple finger typists. I think when you, when you move out of the constrained text entry environment and into, say, the, the desktop or laptop scenario, um, things are a bit different. People typing with 10 fingers, eight fingers, two thumbs, um, the, the information flow that you can get through that is actually very high. And, and so... We would, in general, we would, we would look to deploy a type of technology that may assist people in typing certain things that are very formulaic, like perhaps addresses, and potentially also in correcting errors. But I think I would not expect that a, that a, a, a sort of word selection style of text entry would replace typing on a, on a laptop. Very quickly, your second question. I think um, being able to, to feel... We, we call it tactile feedback. Being able to feel where your fingers are and, and to get feedback from the device, I think, is really important. Actually, I think it's, it's a current weakness of touchscreen devices that will be addressed in the next five to ten years. So I think what will happen is we'll end up with touchscreen devices 
that actually have the feel of, I don't know whether it will be buttons, but it will certainly feel like, you know, you know where your fingers are, that there's, there's a, a, a tactile landscape underneath your hands. There's some interesting research being done on that at the moment. Any more? I've seen on Twitter that, that uh, someone says, okay, I would like to ask something, but um, I don't know English enough to ask this question. So I would like to invite you to ask also in Spanish, and we can help you to translate it to, to our uh, speakers. So, who was that? <laughs> Somebody who's now extremely embarrassed. I remember this is no nick, so you shouldn't use your nickname. Stand out. Oh, that, that's what it means. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead. Maybe later someone will try to ask some questions. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Wait for us. Thank you. Wait, wait, Ben. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Ben. You have to take your chapella also with yeah, you. Yeah, I uh, almost got away, but no. Very good looking chapella. Thank very you. Nice. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.